Good morning, church. It's so good to be together again this Sunday, together both in person and online. Um, we are thankful that you have joined us today. Um, we have a couple things before we start that I wanted to announce. The first is that we have um, small groups starting up in October. So if you want to be a part of small group, we want to encourage you to check out our Facebook page, um, sign up for our, our emails and our messages, and um, you'll hear more about small groups that are coming up um, starting in October. We also have a couple things coming up with children's ministry and with a tailgate party, so please check out our Facebook page and the children's ministry Facebook page to hear more about that. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to dive right into worship. Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you for the opportunity to be together, to worship, um, and to hear from your word. I pray that you'd be with Roger as he brings the message, um, and you'd be with Luke and the team as they lead us into worship. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Welcome back, church. Let's sing it out together. Your love builds bridges that cannot be burned, speaks truth that cannot be learned. It's a treasure we could never earn. It goes places we're afraid to go in. It's not a fist, it's a hand wide open.
welcome to church. Good to be together in church, whatever the format is, whether there's two or three gathered in the name of Jesus or a thousand people together in the name of Jesus. It's good to be in church. You know, before coronavirus, uh, on the fifth Sundays, we would come together in one service instead of two, and we'd fill this place. And I am looking forward to that day when we get back together and do it that way. But in the meantime, we'll make do. We'll do what we can with what we have. You know, the coronavirus arrived back in January. At the end of that month, the WHO declared a global health emergency. A month later, the U.S. had its first death. Two weeks later, our president declared a national emergency, and the CDC recommended gatherings of no more than 50. And about that same time, our governor ordered that schools and businesses be closed. Now, at that time, many aspects of our daily lives changed. Life became abnormal. But somewhere between March 15th and today, that ab has changed to new. Abnormal is now the new normal, meaning that many of the things we're experiencing right now aren't going to change anytime soon. Some of these things may never change, and I don't like it one little bit, and I don't know anybody who does. But here we are. Now, if, like me, you're a follower of Jesus, it's okay not to like it, but as with any other circumstance we find ourselves in, ourselves in, we should be looking at life through a spiritual lens. And we should be focusing on what we think Jesus wants us to be and what he wants us to do in the midst of difficult, tumultuous, confusing times. And it is confusing, isn't it? We get mixed signals. Uh, sometimes inconsistent directions. We don't understand a lot of the things that are happening right now. But one thing we can be sure of, our Lord does understand. He understands perfectly, and so we depend on him to guide us through normal times, through abnormal times, and in this case, through the new normal because there's a lot we just don't understand. There was a guy we read about in the New Testament who didn't understand. He was also living in a tumultuous time. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 8. That's book number 5 in the New Testament. For those of you who are just learning about the Bible or maybe just uh, now becoming acquainted with Jesus, Acts is the abbreviated title uh, for the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts is the history book of the early church that began about seven weeks after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 is where we're going to begin to read. Here we will look at an account, an encounter between one of those 12 apostles of Jesus, a man named Philip, and a high-ranking govern- government official from Ethiopia. It takes place probably about a year after the church had had its beginning on the day of Pentecost, and it took place at a time when Christians were beginning to experience significant persecution. Christians in Judea, especially in Jerusalem, were being dragged away to jail, sometimes killed. So many of those followers of Jesus got out of Dodge. Man, they fled Jerusalem, but everywhere they went, they continued to spread the good news about Jesus, that he's the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior, that he died to take away our sins, and that he's alive forever, having been resurrected from the dead, and one day he's going to return to take us home to be with him forever. That's the good news. This apostle Philip was one of those followers of Jesus who went all over the place preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the context for this encounter. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem 
to Gaza. Philip was a preacher. I'm a preacher, but I've never had an angel speak to me except my wife in order to give me directions from Jesus on where to go and what to do. I don't think Darren has either. But I do believe that I have received direction from the Lord that was impressed on me by other means that wouldn't have been any clearer to me even if I had encountered an angel. That's been my experience. Why don't we hear from angels like that, like they did back then? I'm not saying that no one, never hears, no one ever hears from an angel today, but, but if it happens, it's rare. Why? Well, for one thing, we have an advantage that they didn't have. We have the New Testament. At, a time, at the time of Philip's encounter that we're looking at today, it hadn't been written yet. And everything that Jesus wants me to know, I can read about by opening these pages or opening an app on my phone, a Bible app. The Word of God has never been more accessible than it is today. But I wonder whether or not it's more neglected than it's ever been. Okay, so an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now that's pretty brief, a pretty brief instruction, isn't it? Now if I'm Philip and I'm engaging one of these awesome beings, a direct messenger from the Lord, I'd like a little more detail. Why am I going? What's waiting for me there? What am I going to do? There's a lot of persecution right now. What can I expect? What is the plan? But from the angel, it's simply go. Verse 27. So he started out. That is Philip. Started out. No preparation, no packing, no questions, just so he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book, at, the, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. This Ethiopian was a foreigner. He wasn't a Jew by birth, but somewhere along the line, he had become a believer in the Lord, our God, the God worshipped by the Jews. So as much as possible, he was practicing a faith in the one true and living God, even though he didn't yet know about Jesus. And he was so dedicated to the Lord that he had traveled probably 100 miles, maybe 200 miles in order to worship in Jerusalem, and now he was on his way home. He was a wealthy man, because you just, uh, you know, not just anyone could possess a copy of the Old Testament, or at least a copy of the book of the prophet Isaiah. So he'd worshipped in Jerusalem, and now on his journey back home, he, he, maybe he stopped at a rest area, there was a McDonald's there, he got a big McLamb, and now he's, he's going to read out loud from this book of Isaiah. Now, there's a lesson in almost every sentence of this story for us, so, so listen carefully. Verse 29, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Here we go again. Very brief instruction. Go stand over there. Earlier it was an angel. Now it's the Holy Spirit directing Philip. You know, in, in our world, angels are outside agents who are on missions for God most of the time, and most of the time we are oblivious to their operations. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, when it comes to followers of Jesus, he's an inside job. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. And, our, and the closer our walk with Jesus, the more sensitive we are to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how the, how the Spirit communicated to Philip 
what to do, whether it was an audible voice, maybe a, a gentle whisper, maybe some kind of a, a, an urging of some sort. But the Bible tells us that the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who directed Philip lives in each follower of Jesus today and he's directing us. So we need to be paying attention. He arranged this divine appointment for Philip that day, and he arranges divine appointments for us all the time. The Holy Spirit works in us and desires to work through us, so pay attention. That's lesson number one. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Lesson two, be prepared. That's what Peter, another apostle, commands believers in his first letter to the churches later in the New Testament in chapter uh, 3, verse 15 of that letter. He says, always be prepared, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Are you prepared? Peter doesn't say you have to be a preacher. He doesn't say you have to have a degree in biblical studies. He just instructs us to give our personal testimony about why we have hope. And that also means we need to work on being expressive about our hope in Jesus. In times like these, people who don't know Jesus need to be seeing people who do know Jesus being full of hope. Work on your personal testimony so you can share it with others. If I ask you today, why are you different? Why do you seem to be so content or pleasant or hopeful, what would you say? You need to be able to answer that question, but be respectful. Notice Philip didn't just jump up in the, in the uh, chariot of this, of this important man. He waited to be invited. Verse 32, the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he, he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you know that prophecy is about Jesus. As a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Now, I'm looking forward uh, to Darren's preaching in the future because he's now a shepherd. And the Bible is full of sheep and shepherd imagery. I was a shepherd once, and for years now I've been telling Darren, you've got to get some sheep. You've got to get some sheep. The Bible says, a little child shall lead them. And just a few months ago, it was Darren's child, Josie, who led the family into the sheep business and what began with just a couple of fair lambs is now transforming into a blossoming flock of, of seven or eight ewes and will soon be a flock of 50. And in just these recent days, Darren and Eve and the kids have learned about this very thing that Isaiah is talking about, a lamb before the shearer is silent. There's not another member of the animal kingdom that will behave like a sheep. You try to shear a dog or a cat or a bear or a lion and things aren't going to turn, turn out well at all. But when you roll a sheep over to shear it, it will not make a sound. It will not struggle. It will not try to escape. That's the picture of Jesus going to the cross. Now, unfortunately for the Dawes sheep, as Darren and Eve have tried their hands at shearing, the sheep have learned firsthand about the blood of the lamb. Darren uh, has purchased a large inventory of Mercuricomb. Now, if you never heard any teaching about this passage that the Ethiopian was reading from Isaiah, you'd have the same question he did. 
with no knowledge of Jesus. It's very difficult to understand this prophecy. So we ask the obvious question, verse 34, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Lesson number three, engage people where they are. That means do just what Philip did. Listen to them. Take time to listen to people. And as you listen the whole, with the Holy Spirit as your guide, you will determine where they are in their spiritual journey. And that's where you begin. Follow Philip's example. Share your faith with people beginning where they are, not where you think they should be as you lead them to faith in Jesus. Well, Philip must have done a pretty good job of explaining about Isaiah and connecting that passage of Scripture to who Jesus is and why he came here and what he did and how he fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy because verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. You know, because of many confusing teachers out there, it's not uncommon for someone who has a preconceived idea about matters of faith to ask a question something like, do I really have to be baptized? Or, or why do I have to be baptized? Or even... I don't think I need to be baptized. But, but when someone is led to faith in Jesus, beginning where they are, baptism becomes a part of a natural progression. It's organic. When it's not presented as a, a legalistic ritual and instead is presented of that, as that which pleases Jesus, it's as natural and as beautiful, beautiful as the birth of a baby. And it's embraced rather than being forced. Verse 39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Isn't that a wonderful story? I think it's one of the most beautiful events in the book of Acts and the entire New Testament, for that matter. No controversy, no stress, no arguments. Think about it. They were in the midst of a difficult time, a confusing time. The nation was oppressed by the Romans. And for the Christians, not only did they experience Roman oppression, but persecution was at its peak at the hands of the Jews. And in the midst of all of that, Philip gets to experience the joy of leading Someone to faith in Jesus, from darkness to light, from death to eternal life. And the Ethiopian experiences a newfound faith in the Savior of the world. And he goes on his way rejoicing. And I'm sure that as he went on his way rejoicing, he was telling everyone he knew about Jesus and the good news. Now, if you think about it, and I'm going to try to make you do that, you will notice in this account that there is a common thread that makes everything work out so well. What is it? It's obedience. When Philip is directed by the angel, what does he do? He obeys. Now, when he encountered a powerful foreign government official, probably accompanied by armed associates, an intimidating man, no doubt. What does he do when the Holy Spirit directs him? He obeys. Obviously, when Philip was teaching the Ethiopian about Jesus, he must have explained to him that if he believed in Jesus, he should be baptized. And what does the Ethiopian do? He obeys. The result? Victory, joy, success. All the way around in the midst of a tumultuous time. How's this obeying thing going for you? We used to sing a hymn titled, 
trust and obey. And I want us to look at a verse from that song by way of application right now as I wrap up because this is a song that is well constructed in its biblical theology. It goes, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. I included a couple of scripture references there that you'll have to look up on your own that were uh, probably some inspiration for this song. But with his holy word to guide me and his Holy Spirit abiding in me, the Lord's will for my daily life, my daily walk with him becomes clearer and clearer. And every time I say, yes, Lord, I will follow your direction, the path becomes brighter and my relationship with him grows deeper and deeper, which is the ultimate source for my hope and my joy. The chorus says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust. What's another word for trust? Faith. Belief. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe that Jesus is who the Bible says he is, and you've got to trust him. Philip and the Ethiopian uh, had that in common. They believed. That's the starting point for everything. Then it's obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. No other way for what? No other way for me to get points with God that will make it possible for me to go to heaven? No. That going, going to heaven part was taken care of because of my trust, my faith. I trusted Jesus. I trusted that his work on the cross was complete. And that's what paved the road for me to gain eternal life. Roger, are you saying that my obedience doesn't play a part, doesn't secure my salvation? No, that's not what I'm saying. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Once I place my faith in Jesus, once I do that, once I place my faith in Jesus, I should be doing good works. That's what the apostle tells, is, is telling us there. You have to be, you, once you've done that, you have become a child of God. And once you are a child of God, you are either a child who obeys him a lot or you are a child who obeys him just a little bit. I was talking with my mom about this just the other, way, by, other day. By the way, thanks to, she wanted me to say thank you to all of you who have sent her these cards lately. Uh, they've come on, different, come on different days, and you've just brightened her day, and she really uh, wanted me to say thank you for that, so that's what I'm doing right now. But she's 93 years old. Her reunion with the Lord and with Dad could be any day now, or it could be a year or two from now. Who knows? But in a conversation, as we talked of these very things I'm talking with you about, as she is anticipating her departure from this life, she said to me, what if I've done something he just can't forgive? That kind of thinking comes from some errant teaching for an extended period of time somewhere in her distant past, probably in her formative years. Can you imagine 93 having walked with Jesus from her childhood and still to have that momentary feeling of insecurity? I said, Mom... When I was a little boy and you told me, now you're in your church clothes, so stay out of the mud. And as soon as I walked out that back door, I jumped in a mud puddle and disobeyed you. Was I no longer your son? Did you disown me as your child? No. The fact is there is nothing I could have done to cause you to abandon me, is there? And she agreed. 
Now, in that case, what would have happened as a result of my disobedience is that I would have become an unhappy child for a period of time because I wouldn't have been able to sit down for a while, but I would still be a son. Trust and obey. Why? So I can remain a child of God? No, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. There are a whole bunch of unhappy Christians. We may not always be able to see it, but sometimes we can. One of my favorite songs from my high school days it has a line in it that says, I've got one foot on the platform, the other foot on the train. I'm going back to New Orleans to wear that ball and chain. There is a house. No, I'm not going to go there. Do you have one foot in Jesus and the other foot in the world? You can't be happy, a happy sinner because Jesus is spanking you for disobeying, and you can't be a happy saint or a happy son or daughter because of that ball and chain of sin you're dragging around all the time everywhere you go. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. If you haven't trusted Jesus with your eternity, with your very life, if you haven't trusted him to forgive your sin, why don't you do that today? Call me or Darren or anyone here at church and we'll guide you through that. Trust and obey. Maybe as we walk together, you will say, here's water, why shouldn't I be baptized? But if, you're already, if you've already trusted Jesus, if you've already been immersed, you're a Christian. The question is, what kind are you? What kind of child are you? Are you the one who obeys him just as much as you can? Or, you are, or, or are you a child of God who obeys him just enough to get by? Or so you think. There's no joy in that. You're not happy. So trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let me pray for you about that right now. Our Heavenly Father, I, I want to lift up anyone who is watching or listening right now, and I pray, well, especially for that one who is just getting acquainted with Jesus and, say, and saying, you know, I think I want to trust him for the first time in my life. I think I want to give my life to Jesus. You know, sometimes we're separated uh, electronically, and I pray that, that you would help that person not to be held back by the enemy, but to make that call, to make that decision, and to follow up and help us to follow up with that person, Father. I also pray for the many of us who from time to time have been prodigals in our life, the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter who gets away from obeying and finds out what misery there is and what, uh, what addiction there is, no matter what the situation is. I, I pray that you would remove the bonds of addiction that you would give encouragement, that you would help us to encourage each other, and I pray that you'd help us all to trust you more and to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing worth more than we'll ever
I hope you guys enjoyed that message in this time of worship together. Um, and just that reminder that we are called to trust. Um, trust is such a hard thing, but such an important thing. And we see evidence throughout the scriptures of God calling people to trust him. Um, I pray and I hope today that you guys will trust Jesus. Um, whether that's in whatever circumstance or stress that you are facing in life, or maybe that is with your life, to place your trust in him um, for eternity. Um, I hope you guys can, can grab a hold of that reminder this week. A couple of closing things. Um, it, we have three ways to give. You can give in person, online, um, or by text. And if you guys have anything you need, please let us know. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. Um, just shoot us a message on Facebook. Give us a call, um, whatever it may be. Have a great week.